Debate, some all kinds of things. What? Well, you're on Monday. Okay. What's going, wait, where is the name Okay, let's get keyed in. Profile of Richard M. Nixon. Interesting profile. What's his middle house? Millhouse. Okay, Mars Frank can feel a quiz coming. Richard Nixon was born January 9th, 1913, in Yorba Linda, California, which is on your ID sheet. Richard Nixon was born on January 9th, 1913, in Yorba Linda, California. And where is that? You have to figure that out in a minute. Richard was the second of five sons born to Francis and Hannah Nixon. He was the second of five sons born to Francis and Hannah Nixon. In other words, he had one older brother and he had three younger brothers. He was the second of five sons born to Francis and Hannah Nixon. Now the Nixon family were staunch Quakers, which is a real old-fashioned religion. Matter of fact, Ruth Payne was raised and practiced the religion of Quakers when, as, during her life. So the Nixon family were staunch Quakers. And they moved from Yorba Linda, California, to nearby Whittier, in 1922, and Whittier is spelled W-H-I-T-T-I-E-R. So the Nixon family, who were staunch Quakers, moved to nearby Whittier, California, in 1922. Again, Whittier is W-H-I-T-T-I-E-R. My, my dad's sister, my aunt, lived in Whittier her whole life before she passed away. Never did go see her. Should have, probably. So I've seen her, but not in Whittier. Now, Richard Nixon was unlike, for example, John Kennedy. He was not born with the silver spoon in his mouth. He had to work as a teenager, and he had several odd jobs as a teenager. And I'm going to give you four different jobs that Nixon had during his teenage years to earn money to help the family, who were not a very wealthy group. So he, he worked at the age of 10 as a bean picker in the fields. So he was a bean picker at the age of 10. He also worked as a handyman during his teen years, fixing things, moving people, those types of things. He worked as a handyman as a teenager. He also served as a janitor at the local swimming pool during his teen years. He served as a janitor at a swimming pool in his, in his hometown. He also, during his teen years, was a barker at an amusement park. What's a barker at an amusement park? Back. Step right up, try this game out here, go over there and try that game out there. Someone that kind of was advertising, as you see in these amusement parks. So he was a bean picker at age of 10, he was a handyman, he was a janitor at the local swimming pool, and he was a barker at an amusement park. He also worked at his dad's station. It was kind of a combination gas station grocery store. And he would, many days, leave at 4 a.m. to drive to Los Angeles to pick up fresh produce daily for his father and then return back to Whittier and go to school. So in answering Brittany's question, your Belinda, Whittier, all are in the Los Angeles area. So many times during his teen years, he would be up at 4 in the morning and drive to nearby Los Angeles and pick up fresh produce for his dad's store, bring it back, and then go to school. <coughs> now, he attended three different elementary schools in Whittier and graduated from Whittier High School in 1930. So he attended three different elementary schools in Whittier and graduated from Whittier High School in 1930. Now, he was very well-rounded in high school. He loved history and civics. 
He also played football, and he also starred in the debate team. So he was very well-rounded, athletically and academically. He loved history and civics. That were his favorite subjects. He played football at Whittier High School and also starred on the debate team. And he was the type of kid that got involved in every single group or organization he could. And he eventually ran for president of every group. So he was very, very active. Again, he loved history and civics. He played on the football team. He starred on the debate team. He was involved in almost every group and organization in his high school. And eventually it seemed like he ran for president of every organization he joined. Matter of fact, one of his longtime friends was quoted in a laughing matter that he thought he had voted for Richard Nixon over 20 times for president. Either president of the United States or president of the debate team or president of the ski club or whatever. So one longtime friend was quoted he had voted for Richard Nixon over 20 times for president during their friendship. Um, he was voted, in those days you kind of voted for different class things, and he was voted the best all-around student by the members of his class and he received a full tuition scholarship to Harvard University. So he was named the best all-around student by his class at Whittier High School, class of 1930, best all-around student, and he received a full tuition scholarship to Harvard University. How do you get that? From all the things he was involved in. But you know what? He turned down the scholarship. You know why? He could not afford the room and board. So he got a full tuition scholarship to Harvard University, but had to turn it down because he could not afford the room and board. Now your next question might be, well, why couldn't he? Well, I'm going to tell you the story that happened to the Nixon family, and again, emphasize they were not very wealthy. So he turned down that full tuition scholarship to Harvard because he could not afford the room and board. What happened in 1930, the same year that Nixon graduated from high school, his oldest brother, Harold, contacted tuberculosis, TB, you could use, if you don't want to spell it out. So Nixon's oldest brother, Harold, contacted tuberculosis in 1930. Contact. Contact. Whatever. Thank you, Sean, for your diligent correction there. Now, because of that, where did a lot of tuberculosis patients need to be to, to get better? Hospitals. What? Hospitals. Not so much. They need to be in a, in a they need to be not so much in seclusion, but they need to be in a good climate. So Nixon's mother moved Harold to Arizona, and she cared for him and several other TB patients who were living in that area trying to get better. So Nixon's mother moved Harold to Arizona. And she cared for him and many other TB patients. Is so, Arizona? Arizona's fairly hot, but I mean, it's that's where people went in those days. Honestly, that's where they went, those types of areas, real desert areas. Now, this move by the mother caused tremendous burden to the family financially. So the, during the time that she was down there trying to get her son better, obviously it was draining on the family financially. Now, Harold eventually died, sadly enough, on his mother's birthday in 1932, and Richard Nixon was 19 years old at the time. So Harold eventually died on his mother's birthday in 1932, when Richard Nixon was 19 years old. So because of Harold's illness and the hardship it put on the Nixon family finances, Nixon entered Whittier College in the fall of 1930. He was just 17 at that time. So was, he was actually in college a couple years when his brother died. But obviously he couldn't go to where he wanted. So think about that. He goes from Harvard University to Whittier College. And he didn't complain a bit. He, he felt that is what he needed to do because the money that they spent on his brother was well spent money. So he enters Whittier College in the fall of 1930 at the age of 17. What was he elected right away at Whittier College? Student. student body president. Right off the bat, he's elected student body president at Whittier College. Now, Whittier College was a real strict private Quaker institute. Okay, Whittier College 
was a strict Quaker institute. Just like you have BYU as a LDS college, Carroll College in Montana, a Catholic college, doesn't mean you have to be those religions to go, but at that time at Whittier College, most people that went there were of the Quaker faith. Okay? Now, how did he get elected student body president? He kept a campaign promise. He promised to negotiate dancing on campus because it was forbidden to dance or have dances on campus prior to that. It was seen as lewd behavior. So Whittier College was a strict Quaker institute and Nixon kept his campaign promise to negotiate dancing on campus. You ever seen the, the movie uh, Footloose? Same type of thing. Same type of thing. Yeah. Well, Nixon graduated from Whittier College in 1934 a four-year honor student. He graduated from Whittier College in 1934 as a four-year honor student. And he earned another scholarship, this time to Duke University School of Law. And he took that scholarship. So he graduated as a four-year honor student from Whittier College in 1934 then earned a scholarship to Duke University School of Law, and he graduated there in 1937, ranking third in a graduating class of 44. So he earns a scholarship to Duke University School of Law after his graduation from Whittier College. He graduates from Duke University School of Law in 1937, and he ranks third out of 44 graduates. Very bright, very bright individual. Okay, what year did he graduate? What's kind of going on? What's kind of the, towards the end, the depression? So when he left college, there were very few jobs available to get. And he first tried to join the FBI. That's what he wanted to do, and he was unsuccessful in that endeavor. So he applied for a position in the FBI and did not get that position. After unsuccessfully trying to join the FBI, he applied to a law firm in New York City. Also, <laughs> did not get the job. So he tried unsuccessfully to join both the FBI and a law firm in New York City. And mainly because of the Depression, it was just a tough time. So what do you think he did? What did he do? Not yet. What would you do? If you, okay. Well, you're close. He returned to Whittier and joined a law firm there. Okay? A little difference between working for a law firm in Whittier, California, and working for a law firm in New York City. But he did what he had to do. He returned home and joined a law firm in Whittier and began his career as a local attorney. He just became an attorney in, in Whittier. Well, there was a community theater play tryout during the time he went back to Whittier, and he was going to try out for the community theater play. And I'll be darned if he didn't meet a pretty young woman by the name of Thelma Patricia Ryan while he was trying out for the community play in Whittier. So he began his career as a local attorney, settled down, decided he was going to try out for the community theater, a play that was coming out, and when he was trying out, he met Thelma Patricia Ryan. And she actually was known as Pat. Nick, her nickname was Pat. You know why? She was born on the eve of what? St. <laughs> Patrick's Day. Very good. So she was better known as Pat to all of her friends and family. Her father gave her that nickname because she was born on the eve of St. Patrick's Day. Was she a ginger? Was she what? A ginger. What is that? <laughs> I don't think so, no. Um, <laughs> What was Pat doing at the time she met Richard Nixon? She was teaching at Whittier High School. She was teaching at Whittier High School. They go on their first date, and Nixon throws out the good line to her, man. <laughs> Pay attention, fellas. This is the good line Nixon throws out to Pat on the first date. He said, quote, believe it or not, I'm going to marry you someday. Did it work? It did work because on June 21st, 1940, they married. 
June 21st, 1940, they married. So that was a great line. Keep it up. You know, boys, if you find the right gal, just throw it to them on the first date. 19. Bobby, you're kind of behind, but you could probably throw it <laughs> still here. <laughs> yeah, he, they married on June 21st, 1940. They eventually had two daughters, Patricia and Julie. And guess what their big honor was later in life? Patricia and Julie's great honor. I'm not so sure the fellas that they were going with thought it was a great honor, but... Can you remind me? Patricia and Julie, what was their big, what was their big honor later in life? Uh, Being the president's daughter? Stuff. Got married in the White House. <coughs> they were the president's daughters, yeah. So both daughters had the honor of being married in the White House. Actually, one of the girls married Dwight Eisenhower's grandson. So, anyway, no, the other one married a guy by the name, name of Edward Cox, who was a very successful businessman. But both daughters had the honor of being married in the White House while their father was president. So, they married June 21st of 1940. What happens in September of 1942? What does Nixon join? Army. Actually, the United States Navy, but we got World War II going on. And in September of 1942, he joins the United States Navy. So in September of 1942, Nixon joins the United States Navy. And his, his job there was he was a supply officer in the Pacific Ocean. What's a supply officer? He gets orders from different arenas of the war, and he fills the supply orders and sends them off to the different theaters where people need them. It's a pretty, really pretty safe job. You're not in the middle of the combat. So during his free time, he became a very successful poker player while he served in the Navy. And he's really a shrewd and conservative guy, and so he saved his money as poker winnings during the time he was in the service. Now keep in mind, kids, that this is 1942. Guess how much money he saved from his poker winnings the time he's in service. Okay? $5,500. Now think about the money, monies today in $7,500. Nixon became a very successful poker player in the service, saving over $10,000 from his winnings. Can you imagine that? That'd be, I don't even know what that'd be, $100,000 now, maybe. I don't know if you compare it. He saved $10,000 from playing poker. And what do you think he did with that money? Wedding ring. Spent it on his first car. I said not yet. I said not yet to you, and you guessed what he was doing. Yeah, on his first political campaign in 1946. So he used his winnings to finance his first political campaign in 1946. He ran for a seat in the House of Representatives representing California. So he ran for a seat in Congress, a, a seat in the House. So he used his $10,000 in winnings to finance his first political campaign in 1946 when he ran for a seat in the California House of Representatives. Now, it was kind of a gamble. He must have been kind of a gamble because the guy he ran against was Jerry Voorhees. And Jerry Voorhees was a very well-respected incumbent. So you think about it. He's risking $10,000 of his savings and a year of his life to challenge a powerful Jerry Voorhees who most people think is going to beat him badly. Now, what's the big issue in, in America right now in 1946? What are we all worried about? Communism. Communism. And so Nixon really hammered hard at that issue. And what, during the campaign against Voorhees, Nixon attacked his record in Congress and actually lab labeled him soft on communism. Actually, Nixon fell short of accusing Voorhees of being a communist himself. So who was Richard Nixon? The first real mudslinger in politics, seriously. He was one of the first, if not the first, mudslinger. He went after Voorhees' record in Congress. He pointed out everything that would even hint that he was soft on communism, and he fell just short of his face and calling the guy a communist himself. Well, Nixon's mudslinging tactics worked to perfection as he actually defeated Voorhees by a pretty large margin to become a congressman. So Nixon's tactics worked to perfection. He's elected 
to the House by a pretty large margin against a very popular incumbent. He was, he had, he, he was not pulling any punches, and you'll see this about Nixon all the way through his career. Well, he got appointed to a pretty high-class committee when he was in the House, and it's on your ID sheet. It was the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Believe it or not, that was actually the name of the committee. So he was appointed during his time in the House to the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Now what do you think they were investigating in this country? Communists. Okay? Because we really thought there was a lot of communists in the country. So Nixon soon became a big hitter, so to speak, in that particular committee investigating communists. Now, if Nixon's going to make a career and get into the Senate and go more, he's going to have to make a name for himself. It's kind of hard to make a name for yourself sometimes in the House. But he's going to get a break. This committee was investigating a fellow by the name of Alger Hiss. The committee was investigating a fellow by the name of Alger Hiss. Hiss was a former member of the State Department who some people were accusing of being a communist and a spy. So... The Committee on Un-American Activities had their crosshairs on a guy by the name of Alger Hiss. He was a former member of the State Department, and there were some stories out there that he was not only a communist, but might even be a spy. Who, somebody has to accuse you of that, don't they, if you're going to get that rap? Well, the person that accused Hiss of being communist was a guy by the name of Whitaker Chambers. And he was the editor of Time magazine. And he actually was a former communist himself. So, Hiss's accuser was Whitaker Chambers, who was editor of Time magazine, who at one time had been a communist himself. So, Hiss has got an accuser, and a pretty powerful one, if you look at the title. And so that's why the Committee on Un-American Activities is looking into it. Two. Huh. With a... Whitaker Chambers, like he was former communist, did he get caught and then like, okay, I'll reject communism if you let me say? Well, not so much or that. He, he just decided like, maybe it wouldn't be the best to be a communist in America. <laughs> you weren't going to probably be the editor of Time magazine if you were a communist. If you're you a communist, communist, if you're a communist in a non-communist place, what do you even doing? Mm -hmm. Just saying you're a communist? I guess so. <laughs> Ask me Harvey Oswald. <laughs> anyway. Now, when Chambers testified against Hiss, he stated that he and Hiss were close friends, and again, he accused him of being a spy and a communist. Now, this is a crazy story, and you might, might want to just listen to it and then write down what you get out of it. Chambers said, and he actually took investigators to his Maryland farm where he was growing pumpkins, and he said that there was hidden microfilm in his pumpkins that Hiss hid. I'm not making this up. So Chambers took him to his farm. They found microfilm in the pumpkins. This microfilm showed photos of State Department documents that were written in the 1930s on Hiss's typewriter and in his handwriting. So Hiss did was serving as a spy and a communist. He did take microfilm of State Department documents and hid them on Whitaker Chambers' farm inside his pumpkins. I am not making that up. He did. What were the documents? They were State Department documents, just things that weren't for everybody to see. I don't know what exactly was in it. Microfilm is a little tiny. I mean, some of you watch Austin Powers when they have those little spy cameras. Oh. It's just tiny film that was taken from little tiny spy cameras, and they took the film and stuck it in those pumpkins. Did he, did he cut over? I guess so. Cut the top off, stuck them in there. I don't know. Now, Nixon jumped all over this, and he grabbed the spotlight, and he pushed like crazy, and he got a guilty verdict on Alger Hiss. So Hiss was eventually found guilty and actually was sentenced to five years in prison. But what did this do? What did Nixon's role in the trial do? Gave him notoriety. Basically set his career off in a nice upward style. <coughs> well, in 1950, Nixon's serving his second term in the House. 
And what's he announced that he's going to do? Which is? Not yet. The Senate. He's going to run for the Senate. So in 1950, after this Alger Hiss incident, and serving in his second term, he announces he's going to run for the Senate. And again, he's going to take on an incumbent, a gal by the name of Helen Douglas, who was very, very popular with the Hollywood crowd in California. She was a New Deal Democrat. What does that mean? Whose philosophies did she follow? Franklin Roosevelt. Yep, Franklin Roosevelt. So she's an old school conservative Democrat, but is very popular with the Hollywood crowd. Okay, she's kind of a swinger, so to speak. So, during the campaign against Douglas, what does Nixon emphasize that Douglas is? Communist. Well, too soft on communism. And he gives her the nickname, the Pink Lady. So he hammers on, the, on her, just like he did Voorhees, saying she was too soft on communism. He even referred to her in his uh, speeches as the Pink Lady. Now, this is a 1950-ish he even stated in one of his speech that Douglas was, quote, pink, right down to her underwear. Yeah, that's what he said. So he was, I mean, he was slinging the mud big time. Big time. Okay? So he hammers at her record, hammers at her communism, says she's pink right down to her underwear. He even sent out copies of her voting record in Congress on pink sheets of paper. I mean, he was a guy that was, a, he got after you, okay? Now, he also just made her life miserable. So she had to retaliate. So she basically started telling everybody, you can't trust this guy. You can't trust Richard Nixon. Look what he's doing to me. He's making all this stuff up. She even gave him a nickname that stood the rest of his entire career, especially when we got in, get into Watergate, it comes back. And that nickname was? Tricky Dick Nixon. He hated that name. And you'll hear that a lot as you move on towards Watergate. But she retaliated by saying he couldn't be trusted and gave him the nickname that stayed within the remainder of his political career that he just hated. She referred to him as Tricky Dick Nixon. Now, in one of the most heated political contests ever in the history of the Senate, Nixon defeated Douglas by almost 700,000 votes to become Senator of California. So his tactics worked again. He used tactics that had never been used before that we use all the time. You watch a presidential debate now, all they're doing. You, you ever listen to ads? It's just in terrible how they, how, they, how they talk about each other. Nixon, I think, was the originator of that strategy. Yep. How many votes was it? Over seven, uh, almost almost 700,000. So it was a pretty big victory. 700,000 almost. Okay. What does he do in 1952? He runs for the vice presidency with General Dwight Eisenhower. Okay, General Dwight Eisenhower tabs Nixon to be his vice presidential candidate. When? In 1952. How come he looks so young? Is it he was kind of a young, you know what, he did kind of a young looking guy, really. When you get in the presidency, though, you start to age. He was, he was a fairly young looking guy, yeah. Now, two months into the presidential campaign, the New York Post, which is a major newspaper in New York City, printed a story about Nixon that was pretty detrimental to his vice presidential campaign. The New York Post printed a kind of a detrimental story about him. And it really kind of stirred the pot a little bit and made Eisenhower wonder what he should do. And most of Eisenhower's entourage thought they should dump Nixon immediately and look for a replacement. So an article came out of the New York Post very detrimental to Nixon, to the point where Eisenhower's handlers were trying to get him to dump Nixon from the ticket and move on. Now, what do you think in 1952 would be something somebody would do uh, that might cause some controversy? Cheating on his wife. No, that what? No, that that. He might. He Nixon really wasn't that way, but that just wasn't very 
I mean, it's a good good answer, but it wasn't very. What would you do in those days to get in trouble? No, you're too you're too modern. No, not yet. Maybe what you would do is you would get some money to help finance your campaign that people thought wasn't right. There was an eighteen thousand dollar amount that the New York Post got a hold of that rich backers had given Nixon to help him with his campaign. Now that's pretty normal crap now. I mean, if you think about it, we have to make laws now to say that these special interest groups can only give so much money to candidates. In those days there was no laws, and somebody had given him $18,000 to run his campaign. That's generous. Yeah, in those days a lot of money, but... Anyway, so the New York Post caught wind of that and started ripping him on it, and Eisenhower's urge to dump him. Did Eisenhower dump him? No. no. No, what do you think Eisenhower did to make Nixon kind of get himself out of this hole he was in? What would Nixon have to do to stay on the ticket? Give it back. Not so much that. <laughs> what? No, not, nothing about the money. What would he have to do? Apologize. No, because he's not apologized because he doesn't think he did anything wrong by getting this money. So what's he got to do? He's got to justify getting the money, right? Because basically they're accusing him of stealing $18,000 for his own use. So how is he going to explain himself? What's Eisenhower going to arrange for in this new world for him to explain himself? TV time. TV time. So Eisenhower arranges for TV time so that Nixon can get on camera and explain these accusations and why he received that money. Now... What he did, which was incredibly embarrassing to his wife, Pat, but he did it, is he laid out all of his personal finances for people to see. Told everybody about every cent he had. Most people don't want other people to know how much money they have. It's kind of embarrassing. So Nixon spoke on national television and laid out his personal finances to the nation. Most people, your parents would want, want to broadcast in the daily news how much money they get or what they spend it on, or, or whatever. But he did that because he felt that was important. Now, during, I just want you to listen to this. He said, during, his, during the speech, he stated, quote, Pat doesn't have a mink coat, but she does have a nice cloth Republican coat. And he later went on to explain that the family did receive one gift from a political supporter. He would admit that. It was a Cocker Spaniel puppy. And he said... On national television, Trisha named it Checkers. And regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. <laughs> and so, in political history, this speech went down as the Checkers speech. So basically, Nixon sets up on national television, lays out his finances for the nation, which embarrassed his wife. He made some comments like, Pat doesn't have a mink coat, referring to the fact they don't, they're not wealthy but she does have a nice cloth Republican coat. In other words, we're not so damn dirt poor we can't afford anything, but we're not rich and this money didn't make a difference in our life. But I did receive one gift from a political supporter, a Cocker Spaniel puppy, and Trisha named it Checkers. And regardless what they say about it, we're going to keep it. And that speech went down in history as the Checkers speech. Now at the end of his speech, what do you think he said at the end of his speech? And this was not approved by Eisenhower. Eisenhower saw this as going over his head. He didn't want him to do this. He just wanted him to explain himself. What does he do? He's not stupid. At the conclusion of his speech, he asked the public for input on whether he should stay on the ticket or not. Okay? This irritated Eisenhower because he didn't think he wanted public opinion on this. He just wanted Nixon to explain himself, and he would decide whether he stayed on the ticket or not. But the way Nixon did it is he put it in the hands of the people. And Nixon received many positive comments and calls how he should stay on the ticket. So that's what he did. So at the conclusion of his speech, Nixon asked the public for input on whether he should stay on the ticket or not. This angered Eisenhower. He saw this action as going over his head without permission. Eisenhower believed that Nixon should have discussed the action before going public because he was really the one that wanted to make the decision, and it was taken out of his hands. Well, the move worked very well for Nixon. He received good support from the public, and he stayed on the ticket. 
Well, we know that he served two successful terms as vice president under Eisenhower, and we also know that he lost the bid for the presidency to John F. Kennedy in the election of 1960 by a close margin. Yeah? Did, was the uh, loss with Kennedy his first political loss? Um, yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, and it was a close loss. Did he, did he talk him? No, he did not. He, was, he wasn't near as... Uh, they got after each other a little bit, but the debates... He wasn't near as ornery with Kennedy as he was with these other people. And I, I think part of that is because I don't think he thought he had to. I think he thought, by God, I'm a two-term vice president. I shouldn't have to worry about this guy. Well, because of some things done within the Kennedy family and John Kennedy's father which we talked about a little bit, he loses in close election. What did he do after his loss in 1960? He went back to Los Angeles, California, and began to practice law. Okay, he's a lawyer. So after his loss to John F. Kennedy in 1960, he goes back to Los Angeles. Of course, he's disappointed. It's a lot easier to lose a basketball game by 30 than to lose one by one at the buzzer. I mean, if you think about it. Okay, because you think about all the things you could have done to win by one instead of, you know, whatever. So, it was a tough deal on him. Well, he stayed out of politics until 1962 when he decided to run for the governorship of California. So he stayed out of politics for a couple years, but in 1962 he decided he was going to run for the governorship of California. Certainly he would win that race. I mean, for crying out loud, he was a two-term vice president. He lost in one of the closest elections in American history for the presidency. He wasn't going to have any problem beating Edmund Brown in the California governorship race. But guess what? He lost. And guess who he blamed for his troubles? No? Who didn't he have a very good relationship with? Media. Media. Especially New York Post, that type of thing. So he blamed the media for his loss. It was, he had very, Richard Nixon had a very poor, 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 his whole political career with the media relationship. So in a statement, at the end of his loss, he makes a statement about his loss of the governorship, and this is how he sums up his loss. He says out loud to the media, he says, quote, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. In other words, he blamed the media for that loss. That was a hard loss for him. And when he addressed the media after the loss, he basically stated to them, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Because he felt like the media was very biased against him. Okay, we know that Nixon reappeared in 1968. He wins the Republican nomination for president. We talked about that. He went on to defeat Hubert Humphrey and George Wallace. I will tell you that he was re-elected in 1972. But because of his involvement in the Watergate investigation and scandals, he becomes the first president of the United States to resign from office. And he does so on August 9, 1974. So he, again, he, he reappears into politics in 68 and wins the presidency. He's re-elected in 1972 and will cover Watergate. And because of his involvement in this Watergate investigation and scandal, Nixon was forced to resign from office, and he did so on August 9, 1974. He becomes the first president of the United States to resign the presidency. Good question. Yeah. When you resign, how long do you have to move out of the way? When did you resign? Pretty quick. Well, right away. Why would he resign? No, why get, uh, well, the Watergate's an interesting thing. Nixon's problem in Watergate is he wouldn't tell the American people the truth, and they caught him. Probably what he did was less than what Bill Clinton did with the Monica Lewinsky thing. But here's the thing. Why did he resign? Because he thought he was going to be impeached. Why did Clinton not resign? Because he thought he could beat impeachment. And he did. And Nixon might have too. Okay. Now, Monday, we'll talk about where he goes after he leaves the White House. And then we'll kind of clear it up and then we'll give you a review. Okay. It'll be just enough for the end of this.